All right, welcome, uh, Nangomza and Kobani. Uh, looks like it's only you two this morning. Uh, we can carry on and then the others can join us. What I wanted to do this morning is take you through the, through the uh, um, Excel spreadsheet that I developed so that you can develop your problem statement, your sub problems and your hypothesis. It is important to, to get those things correct. Uh, if, uh, if that is not correct, the whole study is kind of flawed. So it is something to spend a little bit of time on. And in this, in this uh, Excel spreadsheet, we're gonna be reviewing abstracts. Now the idea behind reviewing the abstracts is that at the end of the day, you are joining a conversation and you need to join the conversation at the right place. And a quick way of joining a conversation in the right place is by reviewing abstracts. Now, you don't have, like it says, you're reviewing the abstracts, you don't have to review the whole journal paper. There's a lot of information in the abstract that you can use and it can give you a good idea what the conversation is about. You will see later on and I will tell you, if you find an abstract that is, that is really good, uh, um, then you can, then I, then I recommend that you, that you read the full paper and see what they actually did. All right, but before we get to that, I, I just wanna make sure that you understand what research is about, how I want a problem statement to be worded, or formulated, and where the sub-problems and the hypothesis, if you're doing a quantitative study, comes from. So I'm gonna have a couple of quick slides just explaining to you how I go about it. All right. So what is research? Uh, research is a systematic process of collecting, analyzing and interpreting information, or interpreting data, and in order to increase your understanding of a phenomena. Now that interpreting of data now you'll see later on when we get to methodology, there's a big conversation or a, a debate between what data, what you as a person regard, which data is more valuable, quantitative or qualitative data. And that is a conversation that we'll have later on. But it's something to, to keep in mind that when you are doing your, your problem statement and your sub problems, you know, where are you gonna get the data from and what data are you gonna be collecting? Are you gonna be collecting data through a questionnaire or are you gonna be doing interviews? Or are you gonna do a combination, which is a mixed method? Or are you gonna do focus groups? So there's, there's, there's loads of ways that you can collect data, but fundamentally there's two, diff there's two da data sets, it's quantitative and qualitative data. Um, and I have experience in both and I can help you out with those. So what is research? Although research projects vary in complexity and duration, it has a couple of distinct uh, characteristics and it all orig originates from a question or from a problem. Now you guys are in a unique situation where you, most of you are bringing problems from, from industry and that is great. Um, I, I really enjoy that. However, what I've seen when you are writing you are just just writing from your experience. It is, it is important to get that problem from there, but you still have to go back to the literature and ground your problem in, in the literature. So it's important to go to your journal papers and your conference papers to see what other people has written and what theory there is behind your problem. It requires a clear articulation of the goal. Now you'll see when we are looking at the formulation of the problem statement that each word that you put into that problem statement and sub problems is very important and each word could potentially change the meaning of the whole sentence so you have to really really focus on using the correct words and the other thing is to try and keep it as short as and as succinct as possible the longer your problem statement the more problems you're gonna get yourself into. So keep it nice and short, and we'll still talk about that. It requires a specific plan for proceeding, and that is what we're doing now. 
we are actually this proposal is a plan it's and if you you know the execution thereof depends on how good your plan is so if your research proposal is not great then probably you're going to have problems when you are ex executing so that's why i in my from my experience i put a lot of emphasis on the proposal and put a lot of effort into it so that i know that you are on the right track and then after your research proposal i can almost just leave you because there's no doubt in what you have to do you just have to go execute um, it is guided by a research problem or uh, um, or, or question it uh, divides your research usually divides the uh, principal problem into manageable sub problems or sub questions and you'll see we'll talk a little bit about that later on so you have an overarching problem but that's, uh, that can be divided into smaller bits and pieces. It normally has some critical assumptions that you have to make, and uh, we're gonna talk about that. And it requires the collection and interpretation of data. Um, in your other undergrad, you probably had a lot of assignments where you just did literature reviews. Uh, in your honors, you might have collected a little bit of data. This is the next step where you collect data and you and you interpret it and analyze it at a little bit of a higher a level. And research is cyclical. Uh, um, this, is the, this is normally what I give my honor students. We start off with a, with a research problem. You begin with a problem with an unanswered question or problem. Uh, research defines the goal of clear statement of the problem. You, that's the statement of the problem that we're gonna talk about later on. That is divided into smaller sub-problems. If you have a quantitative study, then you, might, then you will have a hypothesis, which is an educated guess, uh, which comes from the literature, about a possible solution or why that problem exists. From there on, uh, it looks at the data and is guided by the problem. And you, analyze, you gather the data and you interpret it. And from that interpretation of the data, then there might be more problems coming out. So you might solve your problem that you originally have had here, but there might be something coming out. And that is what you're going to do in your last chapter when you're actually finishing your treatise. You're going to be saying, okay, well, we researched this. This is the possible solutions for what I've studied, but I've seen a couple more problems here. And, and you give that, and you state then that more research has to be done here. And that is where the next generation of research has come out. So that is important for you as well. If you find something, some, somebody's treatise or thesis or dissertation that you really like, go to the last chapter and see what they kind of recommend it for future research. It's a good way to get uh, more, to see what has been done. Again, you join in the conversation. All right, so let's talk about the statement of the problem. Um, this problem statement normally has nine attributes. It's clearly, it's cl a clarity and precision. As I said, every word is very important that you use in, in your problem statement. The identification of what would be studied while avoiding the use of value laden words and terms. So use words that's commonly used. You will also see normally that different continents use different kind of words. Uh, um, so America might have an another word that means the same as us and that you have to identify. And you, you have to use the words or the terminology that we use here in South Africa or in Africa rather than the words that they use in America or Europe. The identification of an overarching question and key factors or variables, that, that is the theory where is your theory coming from and what theory are you going to be using the identification of key concepts and terms articulation of the study's boundaries you need to tell me you know where where is what is the boundaries of this research you're going to do it in south africa or you can do it in the eastern cape most of you when you are getting you have problems from the industry and a lot of you have access to information which is case specific. So you can have a case study as well where you're just looking at one company or you're just looking at one case. 
Uh, and and that is, that's probably more qualitative, but we'll talk a little bit later about this. The conveyance of a study importance, why is it important? Well, the benefit of it in the justification. You'll see still later on, justification is quite important um, for everything that you do, especially in your, in your methodology, you have to justify everything. So you'll say, this is what I'm doing, and then you have to justify it. That's the rule of thumb. Every time you say, this is what I'm gonna do, you have to justify it, and justify it with literature, from previous literature. No use of unnecessary jargon. Okay, so every problem statement normally has four components, and you will see, this is where we differ a little bit from Prof Shikantu and Prof Smallwood. We have a, our problem statement is a little bit more chunkier than theirs, but it's the same. The, the buildup of it is very, the buildup of it consists of a couple of elements where the CM department, you'll see they only have the identification of a problem. So they have one phrase there saying, this is the problem. But we've seen from literature and especially Hernan and Swartz, they said that uh, a problem statement has four distinct parts and we're sticking with that. And when you're presenting your, your proposal to the panel, I will then tell you, you probably can only use, the, only use that one phrase or the identification of the problem. So first of all, a problem statement has a lead-in, then it is a declaration of originality, then indication of the problem, and that is the most important bit. What is the problem? and then explanation of the study significance and the benefits thereof. So it's got those four components. And I need to see when you're developing your problem statement, I want to see all four of those. You can highlight the problem statement by building it. And I'll show you now. This is an example of one of my honor students, Gerdes Klute. He did it on uh, a marketing of quantity surveying services. This is his lead -in. He says, uh, Professional service marketing strategies are rarely implemented and professional service providers believe that success can, can produce an increasing demand for one's services, despite the importance of service marketing as emphasized in previous quarters. However, very few marketing studies have been done in the quantity surveying profession. So that is the originality. And here comes the problem statement. And that's why I've bolded it. Quantity surveying firms fail to utilize marketing in order to gain a competitive advantage over other firms. And then we have the benefits. Non-engagement in marketing strategies prevents the specific professionals from experiencing a significant number of benefits, such as building and, maint and maintaining profitable practices. So this is the full thing. The most important bit is that, uh, is that bold part. And that is your problem statement. And that's probably the thing that you're gonna be using in your, when you're presenting. Uh, because Prof. Smallwood and Prof. Uh, Winston Sukantu, they, they like the smaller version of it. Now, each problem can then be divided into, into smaller sub-problems. Uh, the problem statement is probably more, much too complex, uh, um, so you need to divide it into smaller bits. The sub-parts of the main problem are called sub-problems. So by viewing the problem through the sub-problems, the researcher can frequently get a better idea of how to approach the research. Now the number of sub-problems, and that's a question I normally get from students, how many sub-problems? Um, it's a good question. It depends on the scope, depth, and nature and level of the, of the research. Normally at master's level, uh, uh, we say four sub-problems or sub-questions sub is enough. I would rather, my, my philosophy is I would rather you go in depth into lesser sub problems than having a whole lot of sub problems and just skimming over it and, and not discussing it in detail. And that's, I'll, I'll tell you, for example, at our honors level, the previous external examiner had a big issue with this. And we normally suggest, we used to suggest three sub problems for honors level, but he said, no, that, that's, that's too much. So he, was of the opinion that one or two sub problems at honors level is more than enough and then you go into depth and, and to a certain extent i agree with him about that so make sure that when you have your sub problems that that you don't have you know that you rather have quality over quantity so it's often helpful to break up the main research question into sub problems uh, um, 
So for example, suppose you want to get from your hometown to uh, 50, to your hometown, which is about 50 kilometers away. So the principal goal is to get from one location to the other expeditiously as possible. However, soon you realize that you know, there are several sub-problems involved with this. So let's have a look at that as, a, as an example. Main problem then, how do I get from town A to B? And that can be divided into various sub-problems. You know, what is the most direct route? How far do I travel on the highway? Which exit should I take to leave the highway? So you can see here that that main problem is divided into smaller problems. And the main problem is addressed by addressing the, the various sub-problems. So when you have, when you have, you will still see that this is more a, a quantitative, when you are having quantitative studies, then you probably have sub-problems. When you have qualitative studies, then you, you're probably gonna go more towards the sub-questions. Uh, um, and uh, hypotheses are more, more related to, to quantitative studies. Okay, so if you have a quantitative study, if you're gonna gather quantitative data through a questionnaire, then you need to have a hypothesis. And now the hypothesis is an educated guess, um, and it provides a tentative explanation of a phenomena. Uh, um, However, you must, this is, this is, the guess needs to come from the literature. So you can, when you have your sub problem or sub question there and you need to have a hypothesis, you need to tell, you need to show me in your literature review what the literature points towards. It is not just something that you, that you pluck out of the air. It needs to come from your literature. Now I'm gonna give you an example here. Okay, so in terms of hypothesis, how do we formulate the hypothesis? So you come home after dark, you open the door and you reach inside for a switch that turns, uh, that turns a nearby table lamp on. Your finger, find this, your finger finds the switch, you flip it, there's no light. Okay, so at this point, you begin to construct a series of reasonable guesses, hypotheses, to explain the lamp failure. There can be various problems there. It can either be the bulb is burnt out, the, the lamp is not plugged in, there was a thunderstorm, the wire is faulty, or you forgot to pay your electricity bill. So each of these, each of those are possible hypotheses that, that could possibly be a reason for why, for the problem, for why there is no light. So each of these provides a direct, a direction to, to resolve a problem. So you go, in search of information to determine which hypothesis is correct. You look at the data that will support one of the hypotheses and are able to reject the other. So you go out to your car, you get a flashlight, you find a new bulb, you insert it, the lamp fails. So hypothesis one is not supported. You glance down at the wall in the outlet, you see that the lamp is plugged into the wall, so hypothesis two is not supported. You look at the neighbor's homes, everyone has electricity, Hypothesis three is not supported. You go back into your house and you lift the cord that connects the lamp to the wall outlet and the lamp brief, briefly flickers. Uh, you lift the cord again and again the light comes on briefly. So the connection of the cord is defective. So hypothesis four is supported. So that is, that, so that is then how you create these various hypotheses. Obviously, for each one of you, for each one of your sub, the rule of thumb is that you, at this level, that you have, for each sub problem, that you have one potential hypothesis. Now, you see that all of those are potential hypotheses there. They, there was five or six here. But you need to pick the one that is most probable. And the one that's most probable will come from the literature. And you need to show it to my, in your literature. And it's probably gonna be, when you're doing a literature review, it's gonna be the section that you focus on the most uh, and when you're discussing your literature. So our good hypothesis provides direction, should be brief and clear, should be testable, and it should only have one variable. And that is where a lot of students uh, have a pitfall. They have more than one variable. So once you use the word and, then there's already a problem. Uh, um, if you use the word and in, in, in terms of a relationship, then 
then it is fine. But if you are just doing a descriptive statistics and, uh, and you use the word and, then it normally means that there's two variables in there which doesn't point to a relationship and, and then that there's a problem. All right. So let's go to the spreadsheet. Uh, um, use the spreadsheet. I want you to use the spreadsheet to develop your problem statements, our problems and hypothesis. The idea uh, uh, um, is for you to review journal papers, journal paper abstracts. As I said before, you are joining a conversation. And if you think about a conversation, uh, um, if you join the conversation late, then, then, then that's problematic because you don't know what's been said before. But in this, in this terms, you can prevent you, from, prevent you from making a fool of yourself by actually going to see what the whole conversation was about before and joining the conversation at the right place. Uh, um, so it's important to know what has been said before in terms of that conversation. And that is why we review the abstracts. All right. So let's go. This is the... This is the template that I, that I sent you guys before. So what I, after, you've got, after you've done your first uh, um, run or first draft of your title, your problem statement, your sub-problems and hypothesis, put it in here. I want to see, I want to see how everything evolves. That's why I've, put here one, two, three, four, five, six, and I'm probably gonna be reading the last one. But I want to see how, how everything evolves and what have you considered before. So first of all, I want you to put in your, your title formulation. If you scroll over title formulation, you will see that there is a guide for how to formulate a title. Now here is similar titles, and when we review abstracts, from journal papers or for conference papers, all the nice articles which is in line with your art, with, with your topic, put it here so that you can see what's the words and how they formulate the various titles. And I'll show you an example later on of how one of my doctoral students did it. He, he had about 20 articles, uh, titles here, which, which he then he sometimes uses some of the words in his own title. Same with the problem statement. I want you to put it in here, and as you evolve the problem statement, I want to see the newer, newer versions here. Once again, when you scroll over it, you will see there that there is a, uh, um, there is an indication of, of how you do a problem statement. Subproblems and hypothesis. Here you put those in, and once again, if you scroll over, they will see that this is how you do a subproblem. Make sure that your subproblems and your hypothesis are aligned. So if that is the problem, <clears throat> what they need to be aligned, this is, and then this will be the possible solution to that problem or why that problem is occurring. If you're doing qualitative, you will probably have some questions and you'll put that in there. So based on your, based on your problem statement, then you're going to have once you've created that problem statements, you'll probably see what the keywords are. Use this um, keyword generator from Texas University of Texas in order to create a number of keywords. Now, the idea behind creating the keywords is it is it is you use it for search purposes. You're searching the databases later on with these keywords, and it's important to put down the keywords that you are using. The next tab then here is the various databases. And you'll see that there I, I give you um, guidelines of how to use various searches. These are probably the six databases that you're gonna be using. If you don't know how to use the databases or log into the library, you need to tell me so that I can ask the faculty librarian to, to help you out with uh, access to all of these. EBSCOhost, Emerald, Science Direct, Web of Science, Taylor Francis. They are all very good. Uh, and normally, I start off with a, just a Google Scholar to generally see what, what information is coming up, what journals are coming up. But what I put in here underneath each one of these, I use the keywords that I have here that I've, that I've identified here, and I make sure that I put in the keyword here. 
don't go so that I know when I come back after a couple of days of maybe doing something else that I know these are the keywords that I've used here and I'm not doing it again. And I'm not searching for that keyword in that specific database again. So once, once you've used this, and then you're going to start finding journals, journal articles within each one of these databases. And uh, then I want you to review the various abstracts. Now, in terms of the review, I want you to put the year there. Now, the year is quite important. Uh, um, you'll still see that Prof Shikantu and Prof Smallwood, uh, um, as well, you know, uh, um, you're probably not going to use information older than 10 years. Try and avoid that. If you are using information that's older than, or journal papers that's older than 10 years, then it needs to be a seminal paper. Now, a seminal paper is a paper that has been cited a lot, and a lot of people are saying, well, this is a good paper. So if it is a seminal paper, then, then I would agree that you can use something that is a bit older than 10 years. But otherwise, you would try and avoid it as much as possible. Make sure, and that is one of the first things that you do as, a, as an examiner when you're examining some, somebody's uh, um, treatise or dissertation, is that you go look at the references and see how many references they have and see how many are older than 10 years. And if they are older than 10 years, are they seminal papers or not? Uh, once again, it's about joining the conversation. If you have papers that is 10 years, 10 years old, and then you're not joining the conversation at the right place, then you're joining an old conversation and the conversation might have moved on already. So what I want you to do there is put the date in, the journal where it's from, the main author. That is important as well. Put the main author in there. You will still see when, when you reviewing all these papers, you will see that the guys, you will see some, some people, authors coming up all the time. And that is, that is quite a good search criteria as well. So if you see that coming up two or three times, go Google that author and see if he's got more papers relating to your topic. Normally, a researchers have a very niche area or small area that don't publish wide in lots of different areas. So the, the probability of him, if he's got one or two papers in that area, the probability of having more is quite good. So go Google it or stalk that, stalk that guy on Google and see if you can find more papers that he's written. Title, location of the study is quite important. Obviously, in research, you start off wide uh, and you have that trough kind of idea. So you're going to start off wide. You might have literature of global literature of uh, um, say your specific topic in Europe and America and then you move in closer then you start moving into the uh, um, African context then you, then Southern Africa and then South Africa and even if you have if you're doing a study on Eastern Cape then you move in there so it's important to see where the studies have been done then record their aims the methods used uh, um, and that that's that's all information that can be found in your in your abstract now, the number of responses, uh, you will probably have to go look a little bit in the paper to see how, how many responses is good. It will give, also give you a good idea, good idea of how many responses or interviewees, interviews you, know, you, need, you need in order to do your research. And then your results indicate, indicate to me what the results are. And that most... All of the information except probably for the number of responses you, you will find in your abstract. The gems here, if you identify a, a study that's, that really interests you and you want to read it a bit further, uh, read the whole paper, give it a click uh, um, and make sure that you read the full paper. Now, at this level, nothing is stopping you if you find a gem like that to replicate that study. Replicating doesn't mean that you are copying the study or you are plagiarizing the study, you're taking that study and you're coming to do it here. Say for instance, there was a study done in, in Nigeria and there's a specific problem and we have a similar problem. Then you can take that study and you can come do it here in the South African context. And okay, nothing is stopping you from doing that. And that is probably at this level, it is first priced because there would be a instrument there that you can use 
and that instrument has been tested which and validated which helps you out a lot in terms of the instrument um, in, in terms of your instrument and, and the validity of your instrument so if you find a nice questionnaire that has been used by various other people i found that there's a lot of questionnaires that have been developed by psychologists in in the business realm and uh, um, that's been tested over and over again and there's a reliability with it and a lot of my honor students that's what i do with my honor students they uh, ask them to go find a questionnaire in their topic and then we use that questionnaire all right then we have the limitations which you kind of delimit your study where it is who's participating and your assumptions and your definitions now what i want you to do after every 10th abstract review i want you to circle back to your title and relook at your title to see if you can change your title, make your title a little bit better. Same with the problem statement and your sub problems. After every 10 reviews, come back. See, see if that, that 10 reviews is changing your perception and changing the where you're gonna join the conversation. It's important to make that cyclical uh, uh, make it like a circle, the full circle. You have to come back all the time to see if your title, your problem statement, sub problems are going to change based on those 10 reviews that you've done in terms of your abstract. So this is important. This is a, this is a very, very powerful exercise. And I'll show you what my doctorate student has done. This is my doctorate student. Um, he's doing it on differentiation strategies or uh, different kind of strat business strategies of SMMEs in South Africa. Now, this, you can see the evolution of his title here. Every time that he finds a title, he put it in here, uh, um, and then his kind of title evolves. So well, he's only got two problem statements, but your sub-problems as well. Keywords as identified. Here he's kind of listed all the all the searches that is done in every uh, um, in every database. While I'm here, if you find a really good paper that you like, then you probably have identified it as a gem there. But go to that references section and see and see what papers they have referenced, and try and find those papers. That's normally what I do, and you'll see with, with a couple of couple of my my research that I'm doing at the moment, I've almost only got two or three searches that I've done here because um, I find one or two really good papers and then I go to the re reference section and I make sure that I find all of them, all of those uh, references. And you will quickly see that you are up to 200 abstracts. All right. And then here, here is his review. I think he's up to, um, he's about, He's got about uh, 200 that he's reviewed at the moment. So I think I've asked you for about 100. Uh, normally, uh, the PhDs needs to have, do a quite a bit more in terms of uh, reviewing, making sure that they start or join the conversation at the right place. Anyways, um, I think that is it for today. Um, are there any questions? I see Kubani and Nangomza, you, you are the only ones that were here today. Do you have any questions pertaining to what I've told you? Remember that you can, you can ask questions in that uh, text box. Are you both good? Maybe you can give me an indication there. Oh, Science Direct. Okay, I'm not, uh, Nangomza has got a question here. He's asking, I'm struggling to log into Science Direct. It always says my connection is not secure. Well, I'm gonna go, I'm not sure about that. I'm gonna find out with the faculty librarian what the problem is there. Um, Science Direct, you probably, if you 
Let's go to the searches here. The, the ones, the databases that's I'm not sure there will be quite a, a lot of information in Science Direct. If you, most of the information will probably be from EBSCO host here, EBSCO host in Emerald. And uh, Taylor France is, is also good, but their journal papers tends to be very high grade. It's more for at PhD level. You'll see, still see if you go to Taylor France's, they, uh, um, if you're interested in doing a PhD, then you need to read those and they are very higher grade. Uh, um, but at this level, EBSCO host Emerald uh, um, is good. Science Direct, I will find out. I'll find out. Ngum, that's a good question. Uh, um, I assume that you, yeah, you, you're not here, so you're joining remotely. I will find out from them and I'll get back to you. All right. Okay, thank you very much for joining. Uh, I hope you have a good Saturday. I will put this on my YouTube channel and then you can have a look at it a little bit later on again. But uh, thank you for joining and enjoy the rest of your rest of your Saturday. Enjoy the rugby as well. Bye.